Hello and welcome to this evening's RLI Power Hour webinar titled Branding, How to Define slash Redefine Your Personal Brand. My name is Dr. Jennifer Nathan and I will be co-moderating this evening's session with Dr. Bob Pyatt as we are co-chairs for the RLI Power Hour webinar series. Before we get started, there's just a few items that we did want to go over with you so that you know how to better participate in this evening's event. So when you join this evening's event, you join through the Zoom platform. At the very bottom of the Zoom window is the Zoom control panel, and you can see an example of it right here, um, the Zoom control panel. So on this control panel, there's two icons that we want to draw your attention to. The first is the chat icon. This icon you would use if you're having any sorts of technical issues. So if you're having technical difficulties, click on the chat icon, up comes the chat window, you type in your issue, hit send, and then our staff will see it on their end and will then reach out to you to help you resolve your technical concern. The second item I wanna draw your attention to is the Q&A icon right here. This is um, to be used if you wanna ask a question of our speakers. So when you click on this icon, up comes the Q&A box, you type your question in, hit send, and we will see it on our end. And we'll then ask your question for you of our speakers when the time arises. We will be accepting questions throughout the webinar. However, we will not actually be specifically asking them and addressing them until we get to the Q&A session at the very end. One other item that we do want to mention to you is that this is a recorded webinar and all participant questions will be included as part of that recording. So we do want to make you aware of that. So I'm now going to turn things over to Dr. Pyatt to introduce this evening's faculty. Dr. Pyatt. Thank you, Jen. We have two fantastic faculty here this evening, and I'm going to give you a little bit of their background. Dr. Samir Patel, MD, FACR, is a radiologist with Radiology Incorporated in North Central Indiana, and he is fellowship trained in breast imaging. He is a member of the board of directors of Beacon Health System, which is the largest health system in North Central Indiana. Dr. Patel is the founder and director of Radiology Incorporated value management program, and he has given multiple national presentations related to classifying, quantifying, and presenting the value-added activities performed by radiologists. He has also been involved in organized medicine at the local, state, and national level, including many ACR activities, such as imaging 3.0 case studies and being a current member of the peer learning committee. He is also on the economics committee for the Patient and Family-Centered Care Commission. And he also serves on the Economics Committee for the General Small Emergency and Rural Practice Commission. He is also a past member of the Council Steering Committee, a technical expert panel, and also the Joint Committee on Breast Imaging Appropriateness Criteria and Practice Parameters. Our other excellent faculty tonight is Dr. Kimberly Beavers, MD. Kim is a breast imaging radiologist in Orlando, Florida. She attended medical school at the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine, where she graduated AOA and received the Department of Radiologic Sciences Award and was inducted into the Gold Humanism Honor Society. Kim completed her radiology residency at Adventa Health in Orlando. While in her residency, she was active in organized radiology, serving as a communications officer for the ACR's RFS. And she also was with the Florida Radiological Society and the Florida Medical Association with involvement. She was selected for and completed the ACR Rutherford Levante Fellowship in Government Relations, served on the RADPAC board, and was the inaugural recipient of the Florida Radiological Society H. Martin Northrop Leadership Award. Kim completed a breast imaging fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City, where she trained in breast and body oncologic imaging. As a fellow, she was a panelist for the 2019 RLI Summit session on personal branding. Following fellowship, she returned to Orlando as a faculty member at Adventa Health Imaging. Dr. Beavers is also active in the American Association for Women in Radiology, recently being the inaugural recipient of the AAWR President's Award in 2020. Again, it's quite a pleasure to have these two outstanding faculty with us tonight. And we will now start off the program with Kim Beavers, Dr. Beavers. 
Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I'll take a moment to get my presentation shared. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna talk about personal branding tonight, specifically how to define and redefine your personal brand. My portion of the talk is going to be centered on residents and fellows, while Dr. Patel's portion is going to talk about early and established career radiologists. Dr. Patel and myself have no disclosures. And tonight, again, I'm going to focus on residents and fellows leveraging your talents to achieve your goals. So our learning objective succinctly of what we're here to learn is what, why, who, and how. Then I'm going to go over some basics of social media and then conclude with some final thoughts on personal branding. So I'm gonna start with a quick quote from Steve Jobs that reads, to me, marketing is about values. This is a very complicated world. It's a very noisy world. And we're not going to get a chance to get people to remember much about us. So we have to be really clear on what we want them to know about us. People with passion change this world for the better. And I think that that's a good example of personal branding. Although he was talking about Apple, of course, there's some applicable things that we could do as well. So if all of this talk about branding is making you nervous, you can just relax because you already have a brand. So what I'm trying to do in this talk is bring that brand to your attention and help you recognize, define, and develop your own personal brand to achieve your goals. So what is personal branding? This definition is from personalbranding.com and I thought it was very good. It defines personal branding as the conscious and intentional effort to create and influence public perception of an individual by positioning them as an authority in their industry, elevating their credibility and differentiating themselves from the competition to ultimately advance their career, increase their circle of influence and have a larger impact. And for many of us thinking about our personal brand, the larger impact we wanna make is on the quality of care we provide our patients or the level of advocacy we're involved in or leadership. So here's some short examples that someone may think of when they're thinking about their personal brand. So someone may say, I wanna give my patients the best care possible giving my particular expertise. Or I want to be an educator, providing free radiology education using my unique talents. When I think about my personal brand, it's certainly evolved over time. But in my life right now, I think my personal brand is delivering exceptional quality, personalized patient care and breast imaging through clinical excellence, patient advocacy, and education of future radiologists. So there's a few ways that I live that brand because it's very easy to say these wonderful things, um, but you really have to live the brand. So although somewhat unconventional, I always give my personal phone number to any patient who I'm recommending a biopsy for or who would like my contact information. And I've never had um, a patient call me excessively or anything like that. And I've been able to help coach patients through um, mild post biopsy bleeding, talk to them more about their options in a low pressure setting when they're not in the doctor's office, or just to give them that reassurance that they can trust me to be there for them and support them. So I think that that's a unique service I provide as a radiologist, and I think my patients greatly appreciate it. Another thing that I do to lift that brand through patient advocacy is I'm currently working on a quality improvement project to help streamline our process of obtaining prior outside facility mammograms at the time of screening mammogram appointment. Obviously this has a number of benefits and it definitely saves the patient from unnecessary workup and biopsies. So I'm sure when you start to think about your brand, you can think of a couple of examples as well of how you are already living it. So let's talk about a little bit what personal branding is and what it isn't. So what it is, it's definitely what you wanna show the world. It's your public image. It's how you want to show up to the world. How do you convey through your actions the things that are the most important to you? It can include your personal and professional skills, talents, and beliefs. And it's dynamic and evolving. You're definitely not boxed into a corner. You can change and evolve your personal brand over time 
depending on how your career or how your life changes. A few things on what it isn't. It shouldn't be dishonest or inauthentic. You shouldn't be trying to portray someone that you're not. It shouldn't be someone who you wish you were. And it can't include all of your talents and passions because a lot of us have a lot of different talents. And personal branding is more about focusing that into the things that are most important to us. And although it may seem intimidating, it's really not hard to do. Um, and again, you can change it over time as you grow in your career. So why should you have a personal brand? You can focus your talents and passions. So you get known as being an expert for whatever your something is. You can attract desired opportunities. When people know what your brand is, you'll attract more opportunities for your personal and professional growth. You can filter out projects that aren't for you. Once people are aware of what your brand is, projects are gonna come your way you're more interested in and fewer projects that you're not interested in are gonna come your way. And if they do, you can leverage your professional relationships to direct those opportunities to the right person. You grow in credibility, you become an expert, and you can achieve personal and professional growth. So here's a couple of examples of brands and actions. So if you are active in the ACR or active on social media, you probably know who these hashtag grad leaders are. Um, from the top going clockwise, we have Dr. Geraldine McGinty, Dr. Yasha Gupta, and Dr. Amy Patel. You may recognize Dr. Gupta from her work as a founder of the Future Rad Res movement on social media. Now, these are very three, three very public figures in radiology, but I also want to highlight that there are many ways to have a personal brand. So every brand is as unique as the individual. This is a photo of my husband, Farhad, and I. And I like to talk about my husband because our personal brands definitely have some differences that I think are important to discuss. There may be an assumption that personal branding requires being extroverted or interested in public self-promotion, but this can be far from it. So although I'm a little bit biased, my husband is the smartest person I know. He is an overnight radiologist in our group in Orlando. And he has always been focused on achieving excellence in patient care and in patient advocacy. And when he joined our radiology group, he quickly became known as a go-to consultant for multiple subspecialties because of his breadth of knowledge and his interest in learning. He's developed a reputation via his actions and his consistency as being a great radiologist and a great patient advocate. And he's achieved all of this through being authentic, being consistent, and being committed to his work. And uh, I wanted to give this example because he does not use any social media platforms. And for him, that is true to his brand. So if you're feeling intimidated by the idea of personal branding, it can look different to every person. Your personal brand does not have to be a neon sign. It could definitely be more subtle and you don't have to be in the spotlight to have a personal brand. So when you're getting started, I would definitely recommend that you get out a pen and paper and ask yourself some of these questions. What do I do that adds remarkable, measurable, distinguished, distinctive value? What do I do that I'm most proud of? What would I want to achieve if I knew I'd succeed? What do I wanna be famous or remembered for? And when I say famous here, I don't mean the popularized version of famous we think about a lot these days. I don't think self-interest, self-promotion for the sake of gaining money or fame. I mean famous in the terms of what do you want to be known by your peers for, by your patients for? And what contribution do you want to make to society as a radiologist? So here's a starter for residents and fellows. This is just a word cloud with some ideas of things that may come to mind when you start thinking about your personal brand. You may start by thinking about your professional interests first within radiology and then outside of your daily work. And then after you've that done that, you can start to dive deeper, think about your passions, think about the things that you're adding um, by being you. So this is a worksheet from J. Mark Carr, who is a professor at Babson College. This is a worksheet that we did during the 2019 RLI Summit. And it can be a useful tool for getting your ideas out regarding your personal brand. You can start at the bottom by looking at your current brand or how you're viewed by others now. You may need to enlist the help of your trusted colleagues for this part and get some feedback from them on what your current brand is. After that, you start to write down the unique values you want to communicate 
and some action steps that can help you get there. So after you've done the worksheet, you can start to workshop that elevator pitch or succinct summary of your brand. You can try it on paper. Then if you're comfortable with that, you can maybe try it in a mirror. If that goes okay, you could try it with your dog, a friend, your partner. And then from there, try it with your mentor. Get feedback, see what they say, be open to suggestions, and overall make sure that you're being authentic to yourself. So when can I use my personal brand? When you're meeting with your program director or mentor at a fellowship interview, when you want to get across a focus message about who you are, when you're networking virtually or in person, when you're selecting a project, when you're budgeting your bandwidth, which goes along with selecting projects, being selective about the things you're most passionate about and are the most authentic to you, and when searching for and applying to jobs. So I hope that that was a helpful start to personal branding. And I wanna go over a few social media basics uh, before I turn it over to Dr. Patel. So social media is a very powerful tool, but it's certainly not required to develop your personal brand. It can be very helpful though. So common uses for social media, are professional networking, peer networking, engagement, engaging with your peers, engaging with other residencies, engaging with fellowships, promotion of yourself and of your peers or of your research and education. So some do's and don'ts of social media, definitely use it for networking, stay up to date, promote publications and ideas, collaborate with colleagues, find a mentor and be a mentor. Even if you're a resident or a fellow, a medical student, anywhere in your training, you have the opportunity to be a mentor as well as to be a mentee. So remember that you have that opportunity on social media. Some good don'ts to remember, don't assume that anything is private, don't share patient PHI, don't be dishonest because typically the internet will find out and definitely don't violate any employer policies. So here are five things that you can do today with social media. And if you're not on social media already, I challenge you to make an account, update your profile, put a professional picture in a bio about yourself, follow some people who you can learn from, and then follow organizations relevant to you, perhaps the ACR, and then do some research. Figure out the types of things that you're interested in in your career, and I'm sure that there's a discussion going on on social media about those things. Now, Twitter and Instagram are definitely the most popular in radiology, uh, but there is some activity on Facebook and TikTok as well. You can check out Dr. Yasha Gupta on TikTok. Here's an example of a medical student defining their personal brand on social media. Uh, he did give me his permission, so thank you, Ruben. And he gives a good example by giving a few things he's passionate about, research, baking, community engagement, and he says he's gonna be a friendly face. So he's already branding himself by a limited number of things that he's interested in and passionate about and something about his personality as well. So this is just one example of how social media can be used. So before we close, I wanna give you a quote from an article called The Brand Called You. And it says, the good news, and it is largely good news, is that everyone has a chance to stand out. Everyone has a chance to learn, improve, and build up their skills. Everyone has a chance to be a brand worthy of remark. And I hope that you remember that as you start to develop your personal brand. So thank you very much. I hope that you'll reach out to me. I would love to speak to any of you. I look forward to your questions and thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much, Dr. Beavers. That was fabulous. Okay, we will now transition over to Dr. Patel. Samir. Thank you, Dr. Pyatt. And while I'm getting things uh, set up here, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Beavers, for starting us out on the journey for branding this evening. And uh, I'm gonna continue the journey. Um, and just before, uh, Kim and I come from very diverse practices. So I'm in Northern Indiana and she's in uh, sunny Florida. And I'm in a somewhat of a smaller type practice, private practice. And so branding is important 
in no matter which practice type that you're in, uh, large, small, academic, private. And what I'm gonna uh, sort of continue the journey on this evening for all of us is the mid-career and beyond. And I use the term mid-career kind of facetiously because really by the time you're finishing fellowship and everything, um, you may think that you're just starting out, but in fact, actually you already have a brand that's been built up. So we're gonna continue the conversation as far as what about after residency and fellowship. And so, and it's easy to think that once you get to residency, after completing residency and fellowship, okay, you know, I'm done all these years of studying. I can now get to easy street. However, one of the problems is, is easy street can often, uh, if you're not careful, and if you don't pay attention to your personal brand, may end up uh, detouring on the way to lazy way, or even potentially, hopefully not a dead end. But, and we'll talk about some of these things. And as a mid-career, once you're in practice, and even once you're in a practice for, let's say, uh, several years or even 10 years, 20 years, you may be at a point where you feel stagnated or it's like, really, this is it? Uh, I spent all these years training and everything, and now this is the end result. And so we'll talk about uh, branding in regards to that and how we can avoid some of these things. And uh, uh, Dr. Beavers gave an excellent um, uh, discussion and talk on personal brand. So I'm not gonna, uh, uh, we'll touch upon some of the things that Dr. Beavers talked about and we'll add some complimentary information, but we may use the term in the next uh, tw uh, 10 to 15 minutes of our journey, personal brand, personal branding, a little bit interchangeably. There are some subtle differences. The big thing is a personal brand is really is one story and we'll touch on that but the branding itself is how to communicate your brand and present yourself to the world. So ultimately, so I do sit in a lot of rooms like this, uh, some not as nice, uh, some uh, nicer. And so these are what might a typical boardroom might look like or a conference room or an office or whatever. And ultimately brands are very important with regards to this picture for several reasons. Your personal brand and branding is important to get you into rooms like this where decisions are made. And it can also help you stay in the rooms because one thing for nature is sure, nature abhors a vacuum. If radiologists aren't sitting in these types of seats, someone else will. And personal branding is very important on several levels when it comes to rooms like these, especially as you advance in your career and you have tremendous more opportunities. And one way to, a couple ways to think about personal brand and uh, Dr. Beavers touched upon, you know, the official uh, technical definitions and um, some ways to define brand, but it can really be talked about in a couple ways. What people say about you when you're not in the room and the two white words on a black shirt that people see when you walk into a room. So, you know, don't be fooled. You're always judging. You're being judged. Your brand is being judged all the time. Because ultimately what we don't want to do is we don't want to be that person and everybody knows what that person is because nobody likes that person. And that's where branding comes in, uh, comes into play. So as Dr. Beavers has mentioned, uh, personal branding really is an evolving process. It's iterative, it's not static. And if you think about, let's go back in the day when you were in high school to get to college, to get to medical school, residency and fellowship, uh, young and early career, um, as Dr. Beavers had mentioned, well, you're always evolving. Think about how much energy and time and effort you put into yourself to get from each stage. Well, now you're about ready to enter the longest stage, which is your professional job uh, that may be. And the journey does not stop there. In fact, it will continue at that time. So just for fun, we're gonna do a little bit of a, uh, before we talk about strategies and actual tactics to improve your brand and redefine your brand, let's, say, let's uh, ask a question to the audience here. Uh, when was the last time your CV was updated? And your choices are this year, last year, you're not sure when, you don't have a CV, or the ultimate, what's a CV? So we'll just give it a few seconds uh, for people, just for fun. Uh, names will not be attached to any responses. So we'll just give it a second and see where people are. And I will sort of uh, highlight sort of the benefits and talk about why this is important. And we can flash the results uh, when we have at least a few. And hopefully, uh, oh, thank God, 
at least there's nobody uh, E, what's a CV? So uh, already, and this is very remarkable, all of you, I know this is a selection uh, biased uh, group of uh, high achievers and uh, current and future leaders, but it's great to see uh, people that have already uh, not only have a CV, but keeping it updated. And when we think about um, uh, that, that's gonna be very important. So let's talk about nine specific strategies and tactics to define and redefine your personal brand. One of the things where uh, the CV would be helpful is in order to sometimes go forward with your brand, you got to think about where you came from and what you've done. And so that's where your CV is really, it's a part of your story. It's not a resume. Uh, your CV is kind of like a historical context of all your achievements, recognitions, and a resume is a little bit, is typically shorter really for a job. So your CV really is part of your story, but it's not, it's a component of your brand, but it is not the only component of your brand. It's not what's written, let's say, on the proverbial tombstone for what people want to be remembered for, but is a part of that. A CV can help you be ready for new opportunities. We all know the world moves a mile a minute. And really achievement and recognition and why this is important is really physician well-being and intrinsic motivation. So you might be asking, huh, you know, what does my CV have to do with physician well-being and intrinsic motivation? Well, in fact, actually, it has a tremendous amount, and it is good, and I'm so glad that all of you are updating, which by definition means you're looking at your CV very frequently, because we all know that burnout is very prevalent, not only in radiology, but in all of medicine, and when we talk about burnout, the three key components, emotional exhaustion, reduced self-work, depersonalization, when you look at your CV, next time you take a look at your CV, you really have a lot to be proud of, and sometimes we forget that. So your worth is tremendous. A CV may also explain, man, I'm really feeling tired. I'm doing all these things. And then when you look at your CV, hey, maybe I need to scale back. And really to everything to get you to this point, you really had personal connections. And so that's not to be lost. If we think about the CV, it really is the three most um, highest rated intrinsic motivators for people that are satisfied purpose, mastery, autonomy. It is your CV, which in effect is a part of your brand. So how, for those that maybe uh, don't have, and in fact, actually a lot, I've, I'm in a private practice of 40 radiologists um, and many of my partners do not have a CV. So it could be intimidating. And Dr. Beaver sort of touched upon this. It can start out by just a list of accomplishments and either writing them down, use an Excel or Word document. You know, it's time to really break down a lot of the silos. We don't need to feel like we need to do everything on our own. And in fact, with radiology, we interact with a lot of people outside um, radiologists realm. We're interacting with administration, other people, um, you know, ask them um, in order to how you get started. And so don't be shy. The other thing is, is there are available online tools and, and hopefully maybe in the future, uh, professional organizations can maybe also provide some assistance, uh, but you can pretty much Google anything these days on how to build a CV. And the real key is, and I'm so glad that so many of you are doing this, is really to keep it updated because you never know when you might need it for an opportunity that could come your way. The second uh, strategy tactic uh, for your redefining and defining your personal brand, uh, developing high emotional intelligence. And I really think this is one area uh, where not only radiologists, not only people in medicine, but I think everyone can benefit. And this is something that you're not born with and it's stagnant. You can elevate your emotional intelligence and having a higher emotional intelligence will improve your branding. Uh, the components are self-awareness, self-control, and really it starts with an inward look at yourself. And um, because in a world where the average attention span is oftentimes less than three seconds, it's important that if other people are to see you, to make sure that you portray a great look at yourself, people like to see, which is a very passive process, but really, you really need to look, which is a more active process. So what does high emotional intelligence do for, your, uh, for you? It will not only improve your decision-making, it'll improve your uh, performance, your team's performance, it will help you and it will improve your brand and people will recognize that. 
uh, Dr. Beavers talked about this. What do you want to be famous for? And again, famous is, I should have probably had it in quotations. It's really uh, when you when people think of something that they think of you, and when people think of you, they think of the something. And so for me, it was the radiology value-added matrix, which is all the things that radiologists do other than image interpretation. And so I've talked about this and published this. And so this for me um, is what I wanted to be sort of famous for. But as Dr. Beavers had mentioned, and will expouse upon that, is if you're going to have a brand, make sure you walk the talk. There's certain things that a brand and branding shouldn't be. It should not make the ordinary seem extraordinary. You don't want to have a costume, a false appearance, a facade. You don't want to generate demand where none exists, even though that seems like um, it seems to be the norm these days. And it really, especially in medicine, uh, branding, your personal brand uh, really should be authentic. There should not really be any gap between the perception and the reality. And so for me, uh, those categories of value on a couple slides ago, for me, part of my goal is I want to make sure that I touch um, typically double digits every year of each of those categories. Uh, because for me, it's to be a trusted partner to help others achieve their goals. And if I know that I'm hitting a lot of those different categories of value, that to me, I'm walking the talk. So tactic number five, uh, acquiring and developing new skills. And you think, oh, geez, I just finished residency, fellowship, med school, um, you know, college, all this and all that. You're asking me to develop new skills? Well, again, really, when you start in your practice, you're just continuing the journey. You're not ending a journey. You're not starting a journey. You're continuing it. And so uh, we want to go from the now to the near and the far. Because one thing the 2020 has... Um, shown us that unpredictability, okay, will always be predictable. There will always be things. If you think about in a simple exercise, think about on December 31st of any year, how many things you could have predicted to you, your family, your profession occurred during that year in the preceding 365 days that you knew about January 1st. Unpredictability is very predictable. Acquiring new skills will help you improve your resilience. And again, 2020 really showed, it really tested everyone's resilience. New skills will offer even further uh, opportunities and benefits. One of the things that I did, and there's different opportunities uh, that you can do for learning, uh, and it doesn't always necessarily have to be formalized training, earning an MBA. One of the best things I ever did uh, several years ago was to obtain lean certification. And I was in there with uh, managers and directors from my hospital. I was the only physician. It was quite intimidating in a classroom of close to 30 people. And it didn't matter that I was the MD. We were all learning together. And it was one of the greatest skills that I continue to use today in volunteering and philanthropy, which we'll touch upon in a second. Because what you don't want to be, and again, if you don't want to be that guy or that person, you don't want to be the one hit wonder. And the other thing is if you think that, oh, look at all the great things I've done, it only gets you to today. Maybe till tomorrow, but again, tomorrow you will have to do something new. And so that's important to keep in mind. Again, we don't, we don't wanna stay on easy street and we definitely don't wanna get to lazy way. So uh, tactic six, uh, adopting continuous improvement. And again, uh, Dr. Beavers referenced Tom Peters, a brand called You. And you know, if you're not spending a significant part of your time on projects or other things, you're really kind of regressing. And it's the same thing true with your personal brand. You need to continue to differentiate yourself or market yourself as unique. And you're gonna do this by proving your outcomes and you're going to have to keep showcasing and reintroducing yourself. Again, we don't want one hit wonders. And then it's important to check feedback, get feedback from the market as far as, okay, this is what I'm doing or whatever. How is it being received? Yes, you are allowed to be partly the judge of your own work. You're not allowed to be the only judge of your own work. So that's very important. So again, stagnation, um, if you're a proponent of stagnation, Unfortunately, that will lead to most cases an eventual destination of extinction. Um, you know, really change is the only constant. And, and last year in the pandemic, really it was about adaptation. So again, um, we tried, every practice tried new things. Personally, we had to do new things in order to adapt to the circumstances. And this is the example I like to use. 
Okay, it's the cell phone example uh, when we talk about stagnation and your personal brand will evolve and you don't want it to stay stagnant, okay? Um, no joke, the cell phone, the second from the right was my first cell phone, okay? It was the plastic antenna that stood up and I'm not even sure if it even really did anything. But we certainly know in 2021 that if you were to say most cell phones are probably more towards the ones on the left of your screen, well, that's the reality. And you don't see too many of the ones on the right. So if people are talking about, you know, hey, I like the way things are, you know, I'm good. I don't need to change anything. Again, ask them what their cell phone looked like 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So tactic number seven, and this is a, a very near and dear to me. Uh, I never thought that I would ever get this, but really uh, to get the fellowship of the American College of Radiology is one of the most significant ways to validate and um, demonstrate your brand. Uh, fewer than 10% of radiologists will ever achieve this. Um, and it's really great. The American College of Radiology doesn't toss out these letters uh, to put at the end of your name uh, like candy uh, as other specialties seem to do. And it really, if you'll see the parallels here, it really is a differentiator having the FACR versus other specialties. You had to have proved with outcomes over many years you had to always showcase and reintroduce yourself. And really, if you earn the fellowship of the American College of Radiology, your peers and peer leaders have judged you. They are the market. And for them to bestow this upon you is tremendous uh, validation and a great way to enhance your brand and showcase your brand to the rest of the world. And this is available online at the ACR website, the criteria and everything. I uh, encourage and invite all of you uh, to look at it. And, um, uh, and, and that's a great, wonderful way for your personal brand. Uh, tactic eight, uh, share the story. Again, uh, a story unread, a story unwritten, okay, is not fully unleashing its value. And so you can showcase your brand through your stories, through multiple venues, uh, local, regional, national. We don't have to restrict ourselves nowadays to inside and outside, to inside of radiology. We can go to outside of radiology. And I will touch upon this, uh, you know, not only can you share other people's, but other people can share your stuff. And I'm not as facile with uh, uh, the social media as Dr. Beavers is, so I'm still kind of learning. Um, but there are other ways to showcase things. And the ACR has a tremendous platform called the ACR Imaging 3.0 study. And I'm so glad Dr. Beavers um, uh, referenced Dr. Yasha Gupta. Um, and because on your, the last image on your right, uh, the Imaging 3.0 case study, Early Detection Matters, is Dr. Uh, Yasha Gupta's father, Dr. Samir Parikh. And he had a tremendous story with his lung cancer screening clinic and program that he has and I learned about it when we were just having dinner talking about my ACR Imaging 3.0 studies. And so I encouraged him to share that and now his story is shared nationally. So again, you can share the story through multiple venues if you're not comfortable with social media. You can share it amongst different locations, different entities within radiology, outside of radiology and at different points in times. And again, this is definitely where you want to share a lot of the stories because that will improve your brand and help you keep you in opportunities such as this. And the last tactic, and it's not meant to scare anybody, okay? Definitely don't want anybody falling off a cliff, but you know what happens, um, and, and again, not to be alarmed, and I'm in the 50 plus crowd, so uh, don't be alarmed by this slide. Um, and this is an interesting article uh, from The Atlantic by Arthur Brooks. And yes, while it may be true, part of your work peak is earlier than you think. We certainly know that um, for the average person, it's harder to, let's say, publish as many papers um, as they get more experience to life. It's harder to do as much research because life things happen. However, it is a great opportunity to rebrand um, as you transition to a different stage of your career, uh, sort of late career, or even late middle career. And it's about transitioning forward, not regressing or stagnation. Mentoring is a great way. Volunteering is a great way. For me personally, philanthropy now is a tremendous, um, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity uh, in order to do this on a local and national level. And that's very important to me. And also teaching too. 
So in summary, if we talk about uh, personal brand and branding to dovetail on many of the concepts that Dr. Beaver talked about, really when we talk about brand and branding, defining and redefining, it is an intentional iterative process. It's not a stagnant process. Um, it's not, okay, I'm gonna do this once, I'm done, or I'm only gonna do one of these things. The more of these things on this checklist that you can do, the greater the likelihood you'll be able to stand out from the crowd that seems to be getting louder and larger as things go on. So thank you so much, uh, all of you, uh, for spending part of your day on this journey of defining and redefining um, branding and brand with Dr. Beavers and myself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. That was really superb. We're going to um, move to the question and answer portion of the evening program. Uh, back to Jen Nathan. Okay, just getting situated here. Um, Sorry about that. Okay, so yes, we're gonna move on to the Q&A session for this webinar. Um, just as a reminder to everyone to ask a question, again, go to your Zoom window at the very bottom is that Zoom control panel. Click on that Q&A icon, up comes the box. You can type your question in and hit send. Um, it looks like we've already had a few questions that have rolled in. Um, so the first question is for both Dr. Beavers and Patel. How would you describe your personal brand? So I'll touch on it quickly because I talked a little bit about it during the talk. Um, my personal brand, I believe right now, is providing that individualized patient experience and providing that excellent patient care as well as patient advocacy. That's very, very important to me as a breast imager, and it can be something that I do on a local, state, national level. And then also making sure that I am participating in the education of the next generation of radiologists. That's really my main focus right now. Yeah, and for me, uh, Dr. Nathan, it's to be a trusted partner um, providing value beyond just radiology interpretation uh, to help others achieve their goals. And I sort of kind of showed what might that look like. And for me, it's very important to hit uh, multiple buckets, but to always have someone else in mind, uh, not myself. Perfect. Um, next question is for both speakers. Um, how has your personal brand changed over time? I think that when I was a resident, my it was harder for me to really tack down what I wanted my personal brand to be. When you're in training, you tend to be trying to do everything all at once. You're trying to do research. You're trying to make sure that you're publishing. You're trying to do well on your clinical rotations. You may be involved in organized radiology. So you're kind of just trying to do everything, or at least that's how I felt. Um, and then once I started my fellowship and really started to focus down on what I wanted to do, which was really making sure that I have a very patient-centered and patient advocacy approach to my practice, it really helped me to narrow it down. And it takes some time. And like Samir had mentioned, a lot of introspection and a lot of self-examination to kind of get to the point where you focus down to where you want to be with your brand. Yeah, and for me, it was, uh, I kind of got things started off late. I mean, uh, um, you know, Kim is just uh, light years ahead of me from where I was when I was starting out. So uh, as are many of the participants on this call. And for me, um, it was really just, okay, uh, book study, book study, that was it. Um, I was never really one to give talks or presentations or to do research or, you know, basically everything on my evaluated matrix. I really had no inclination to do any of those things. <laughs> and so, uh, so things will evolve over time. And as I'm going into the next stage of my career, uh, you know, I certainly know that, you know, uh, you know, life stuff happens and part of life things will, um, you know, sort of 
uh, steer you towards your brand and maybe tweak it. And so that's something to keep in mind that not to be afraid of that, but you know, sometimes you just need to pivot in a different direction. Okay, our next question. Do you recommend getting an MBA as a radiologist? What are the benefits? Yeah, so, um, so that has been one of my things that uh, I had always wanted to do. Uh, still haven't done it yet, but we'll see. It's never too late. Um, but I will certainly tell you that uh, with many of the uh, positions that I'm in, uh, in boardrooms and things like that, they really value physician leadership. And I think it's important. One thing is when you're dealing and talking with administrators, uh, lay board people, it's always interesting to know what's on their bookshelf. Where did they go for their knowledge? And, you know, a lot of them may have MBA training and stuff. And so it, it helps us to understand a different type of lexicon in order to even empower us as radiologists and as physicians even more. Um, one suggestion that I would have is if you are to consider doing an MBA and you haven't done one, maybe to consider after being a couple years in practice so you can see how things are uh, as an attending, as an either in private practice or academics, so you can kind of help understand, so you can have a little bit of ground basis. And there's so many opportunities now, online, offline, short-term, long-term, uh, but I definitely encourage, um, if you have the time, energy, and will, uh, it is a tremendous uh, benefit. Okay, um, next question. If you are able to give personal advice, I'm finishing a master's in health informatics after being a radiologist for 25 years. And I'm wondering how to best apply that to radiology or the institution IT world. So um, I will let Kim handle uh, a lot of the, uh, cause I'm not as tech savvy um, as Dr. Beavers is, uh, but I will certainly tell you uh, and it's a very interesting thing because I've seen it in my own practice and being on the board of the health system that IT there now is not a meeting or anything that occurs without the utilization of the term IT resources. How is this? Because originally radiologists were the so-called the only kids on the block. We were the only tech savvy people. We only, we always had, uh, you know, all the uh, technological software and whatever but now all these other specialties are involving it. And the demand for individuals that have expertise in IT is going to continue to explode and blossom, which means greater opportunities. Dr. Beavers? Sure, so first of all, congratulations on finishing your master's, that's awesome. I think it really depends on what you want to do with it in your career. What, is, what are your dreams? What are your next steps? You know, do you want to continue in clinical radiology? Do you want uh, to become a leader in health informatics, working for either a large practice, a hospital, a corporation, and um, kind of exploring what are your goals? What are your dreams for that? And I know that's a tough question, um, but I think that that's an amazing asset to have. And I'm sure that any smart practice would be very smart to bring you on as an expert in that field. Okay, our next question, uh, name a few of your favorite books and resources to learn more about personal branding. Do you, either of you have any recommendations for what help you? Sure, um, I will quickly um, share my screen again, just for one moment. Um, and on my screen, there's a QR code um, that has my references and reading. So if people want to either screenshot that or um, take a picture of that with their phone, I put on there some articles as well as some books that were really important to me in leadership development. Um, and so I would definitely recommend checking that out and finding which one is going to be a good fit for you. Yeah, and for me, um, it was uh, uh, one of the uh, books that actually both uh, uh, Dr. Beavers and I referenced. Uh, which was uh, uh, from Tom Peters, the brand called You. Uh, that's a that's a that's a great um, source of information. Uh, the Harvard Business Journal. Um, if you just type in personal branding, has got some really nice articles uh, related to that. And 
um, the book that I showed on emotional intelligence, and there are several books on emotional intelligence. Uh, really, I think that's an underrated portion of branding. And I know that it's something I continue to work on even in my career is to elevate that. So I think uh, those are uh, from my perspective. And uh, um, just to show the uh, technological savvy, uh, Dr. Beavers gives you QRU codes and things like that. Uh, I will just give you verbal and uh, slide sets. Okay, um, so our next question is, I am passionate about an issue that is viewed as controversial. I have solved that by owning it, but wondering if you have any advice about that. I have given speeches about pro-life issues. It's important to me. I walk the talk. I volunteer to Center for Women in Crisis Pregnancy. I never am disparaging to others or negative to others who do not share my view, but it may have affected referrals to my practice. I am known as the pro-life doctor. I like that brand, but wondering how you would approach a conversation with someone who disagrees with a core component of your personal brand. Again, I'm always respectful, but sometimes it has led to awkward moments with others. I usually just say it is important to me and we don't have to agree on anything to be kind of each other. So do either of you have some comments about um, how to deal with that sort of situation? Sure, um, that can be tough, especially in the medical field. Um, as doctors and scientists, that can be a tough line to toe. And it sounds like you're doing a good job of it so far. You're saying you're respectful of others' opinions. You're being kind to others. I think the only area where it could be difficult is if it is affecting referrals to your practice or if it is affecting um, the way that you do your job in some way, you may have to have some discussion or connection with uh, your referring providers to make sure that you're the right fit for them, they're the right fit for you, and that you're providing the service for them that they need and that your patients need. Um, so it may be a matter of kind of aligning as far as what types of services you're providing, not providing, and then um, making sure that your referring clinicians know that so that there's everything's transparent. Yeah, and I would add, uh, you know, this happens fairly commonly um, in you know, disagreements. And when it gets to be uh, some people, it will become personal. Um, and I think having an understanding, and this is where I think where emotional intelligence comes into really, um, you know, as a tremendous asset is to really understand where someone else is coming from that have um, opposed views. And while you may disagree or have different views on one topic, certainly um, we tend to be more alike than different. It's just that uh, the differences seem to always drown out uh, uh, the similarity. So what are some common grounds that maybe, okay, we have maybe this issue um, and I'm, we're not saying to compromise your principles or your values or your personal beliefs, by all means, no. But there always is an opportunity to find common ground somewhere. And, and the other thing is, is, as long as each side can understand the other side, I think that is probably the biggest thing nowadays. Nowadays, people don't even want to try to understand the other side. And so that is, that is something that I would say is, is find the common ground, respect each other, but again, have continuous dialogue and see where there are opportunities to improve. Okay, our next question. What if your brand and passion is not aligned with your practice and your peers don't value your skills? For example, a practice that is focused on fast turnaround of 200 plus exams a day, but you are more focused on quality care and leadership. That's another tough question for sure. And it's something that I think that we will increasingly face in radiology as our volumes continue to go up. Um, but I think that you really need to make sure that you're either in a practice or you have the opportunity within your practice to pursue leadership, pursue quality. And even if you're not able to reinvent the wheel or change everything about your practice, like Samir had mentioned before, you may be able to find some common ground with your leadership where you can be a leader in an initiative on quality or be someone who um, you know, can be a trailblazer trailblazer in quality, be someone who can help guide the way on leadership. Um, so really finding that common ground with the leaders in your group would be a good place to start, but that's a very tough issue. So I can certainly speak to this uh, because uh, I live it almost uh, 
sometimes uh, it seems like every other day or every week or whatever, where it's like, you know, I'll get uh, comments from some of my practice members that say, hey, you know, what about this value stuff and, and all this sort of things. And so, and this is where I think reintroducing and continuing the message and showing, hey, um, and I, we show this internally in our practice, we have some people that hardly do any value added things, which is fine. However, my goal is to say that, look, we've got this part of the practice that is important and here's why. And ultimately, hopefully that can at least say, if people don't want to be part of the solution, then as long as they're not part of the problem or obstructionist, and you can do things on your own time, okay? It, ju it just depends how you want to choose your time. So even if your practice is maybe, let's say, you're not as aligned, but you have to be in that area for, let's say, family reasons or other things like that, well, it may come at the cost of personal time, but then you'll be able to do the things that you want to do. And again, uh, the slide that I showed, spatial temporal contrast. You don't have to limit yourself to just your own practice. You can do things on a national level with like-minded people. You can do things uh, with administration. So, um, you know, we don't want to go to a dr draconian fashion where it's like, okay, well, I got to leave the practice because the grass is not going to be necessarily greener on the other side. Um, I think the thing is, is uh, hopefully your leadership can uh, have diversity a little bit in the practice. You know, yes, we have to do the volumes and here's why, but then, hey, we also have to do a good quality and here's why. And it's the constant battling act between the two and it's going to get harder. But I think that, um, you know, there are other avenues and don't just limit yourself to just a singular field of view. You've got multiple fields of views to choose from. Perfect. Uh, our next question is, what do you recommend for me? I'm a CT technologist at the moment, but I have extensive medical background and a public health degree. I also do ACR activities within my department and develop and implement CT scan protocols with the radiologists and physicists. I can do more lateral movement in my organization, but it is limited due to union and bargaining seniority issues. I thought about just finishing classes to apply to medical school since I'm almost there, but is that too ambitious? Any comments or recommendations? I think, I think that if it is your desire to go to medical school, it's definitely not too ambitious because if that's what you wanna do, um, you would obviously be a great candidate with all of the skills that you already have. But if the only reason for going to medical school would be to try to move up within your organization, I'm not sure if that would be the right choice if that's, if becoming a physician is not the thing that you're truly passionate about. Um, it sounds like you're very involved in, as far as quality, leadership, process improvement. Um, so Samir probably has some better insights than I do on this, uh, but it sounds like you have a lot of the groundwork already to be a leader in your group. Yeah, sort of to dovetail what Kim talked about, it's never too late for anything. Uh, in fact, actually for me, if you think that, uh, you know, let's say the average starting age for a medical uh, student first year is around the age of 22, let's say, um, and in my medical school class a long time ago, the average age was 26. We had people that worked on Wall Street. We had uh, a dentist. We had a grandfather. Um, we had a grandmother. Uh, so, uh, so one thing is it's never too late. Uh, second is, is ultimately it's what do you want to do? And, and it sounds like you're not getting a degree of fulfillment um, to your own self. And that's where knowing the org structure of your particular organization, <coughs> hey, how hard is it to move up? How hard is it to move lateral? And so, um, but the more skills you have, I will tell you, you will get noticed. And especially if you're willing to sacrifice your own time, uh, volunteering, uh, but ultimately, you'll have to know your work structure to say that, can you do this in your organization or can you do this in a lateral, in a different organization, but also talk to some really senior leaders in your organization, say, hey, here's where I'm at. Here's what I'm thinking about going. Uh, what are you suggesting? But if your heart is really set in medical school, it's never too late. Okay, perfect. So we have time for just one last question. The last question is, has social media become too busy to effectively communicate and now consumes too much of your time to, uh, to be productive? Well, how, do, how do you both feel about social media? Is it taking too much of your time? 
That's a wonderful question. And I think that it's very easy to let it take too much of your time. Um, I have a few stops in place to prevent myself from using it too much and to make sure that when I am using social media, it is for a purpose. I'm not the person who's going to just be scrolling. I'm not someone who's just going to be on social media without something that I'm wanting to achieve or accomplish. So I make sure that my time on social media is purposeful, whether I'm doing a tweet chat, I'm scheduling a tweet, or I'm responding or engaging. I do not keep any social media platform on my phone, and I only do it on my laptop. So that also helps. And I think you have to make sure that when you're using social media, you're thinking about what do you want to achieve with it? What, do you, what message do you want to get across? What's the goal? So if you have a goal in mind, it's going to be harder to really waste time on social media and you can keep your message much more focused and true to who you are as well. Yeah, so uh, so it's interesting. Kim, Kim is a lot more savvy with social media than I am. And it took, uh, you know, I only started, um, you know, in, fairly in the recent past because again, you saw the cell phone I had. Uh, you know, there was no social media or things like that. And for me, you'll have to try things out. And there's there's different platforms, but ultimately I would just have one recommendation. Uh, don't let it consume you. We're already busy enough. Uh, and I maybe look at my social media maybe once or twice a day, that's it. Because I don't wanna get consumed and distracted from the quality that I'm doing. Um, and you, there's different platforms. And, and just because you're on social media, you shouldn't feel an obligation that you have to do something or things like that. We're all kind of learning and experimenting and you'll find your niche. Uh, I find LinkedIn a little bit better uh, and a little bit more for me than Twitter. Uh, I'm not on TikTok. I'm not on, well, I don't know if you can be on TikTok. I, I don't even know the term, some of the terminology. So, um, so I would just say, it's okay to try things out. You know, Talk with some people that are on there but don't let it consume you. And the, one of the biggest things is don't hit send or tweet or whatever, unless you're absolutely sure, because when you send it, it is part of your personal brand for the world to see. Perfect. Well, thank you to both of you for your excellent talks and insight on this important topic. We're gonna go ahead and conclude the Q&A session. Any questions that were asked that were not answered, we will go ahead and turn over to our speakers, which they will respond to offline. The responses will then be emailed to all of our participants this evening. So with that, I am now going to turn things over to Dr. Pyatt to conclude the webinar. Dr. Pyatt? Thank you, Jen. We really appreciate the fi really fine program by our faculty tonight and all the great questions that they uh, entertained and had super answers. The, uh, whoops, can you put that? Slide back up, please. <laughs> we also want to thank the audience for their attendance tonight and for participating in the RLI program. If we can put that last slide up so that I can see that, please. <clears throat> um, so, there we go. Thank you. So please share your feedback with us. We will send a post webinar survey and a recording of tonight's program next week. So you'll have it soon and you can share that with your colleagues. Our next program will be on health equity. This will be on Wednesday, June 16th at 7 p.m. You can register for this and other free RLI Power Hour webinars at www.acr.org slash power hour. Again, thank you for attending tonight's program and have a nice evening, what remains. Good night. <laughs>